Thank you, Stephen. Um, hey, just let me get a, give a pitch for Dave Ross Kelly for next week. I highly recommend you go. I'm a good friend of his. I actually spent a week with him in Cabo last month and actually ran with him. And I was running with him, and um, he said, hey, if you can do this, you can climb Everest. I'm like, OK, thanks, Dave. I'm good. <laughs> Um, Dave has a goal of actually getting to Mars one day, so this guy's a stud, so please go, go visit him. Uh, I'm David Watson. I'm from Tennessee, as uh, uh, Brother Fox said. How many of you read the Book of Mormon today, read from the Book of Mormon? Raise your hands. Bam! You were listening to the prophet yesterday, weren't you? I'm so proud of you. Uh, great general conference. It was good to be here. Being from Tennessee, we don't uh, get the blessings of being near the brethren like we were this weekend, so it's good to have General Conference weekend. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about Sonic, about where Sonic came from, um, how I got involved, and then I'm going to give you a lecture on uh, the fact that we can do hard things, and then I'm going to uh, share some thoughts with you on the fast food business. How many of you, I saw about eight people raise their hand and want to get in the food business. How many of you actually want to flip hamburgers for a living? I bet there's zero. Oh, one. Dude, I will hook you up. So um, I flip burgers for a living. That's what I do. And uh, I remember growing up as a kid, my parents were like, you got to go to school. If not, you're going to flip burgers for a living for the rest of your life. Well, I actually love it. <laughs> Flipping burgers was great. So I started working at Sonic when I was in high school. And um, I really liked it. Uh, I liked the atmosphere. I liked the pace of Sonic. I also liked the fact that I could have free food and bring my girlfriends there for free food. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, Sonic started by a guy named Troy Smith, in, who has uh, lived in 1922 to 2009. He was from Oklahoma. And the cool thing about his story, um, that he actually opened two restaurants that failed miserably before he opened what was called the Top Hat Drive-In. The Top Hat opened in, in 1953 when he was 31 years old. Three years later, he changed the name to Sonic because he put a, a speaker out front instead of a car hop taking the order by hand. They pushed the button and ordered, so he called it Sonic Service with the Speed of Sound. And that's kind of where Sonic got his name in 56. Two years later, you'll see he's still in his 30s. He started franchising in 1958. I started working at Sonic in the 70s in high school, and by 78, there were 1,000 units. Um, they had some tough times. Uh, the, the whole theme of my talk today is that we can do hard things. Sonic had some hard times. In the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, several hundred units closed, and they struggled. Uh, in fact, I actually benefited from that. My first Sonic was a closed one that, uh, that had struggled and, and shut down. Today, there's over 3,600 units, and I want to show you the very first commercial, mostly because it's just really stupid and really bad. Let's see if it works. This is really bad. So, um, oh, what happened, y'all? Next slide. There we go. So now you know our commercials nowadays have these two idiots. Um, <laughs> I won't tell you which two are the idiots there. Um, but I, I think our, our marketing right now is amazing. It's working. Uh, at one point, we actually fired them because we thought people were tired of them and they were offensive, and so we went back to food shots on our marketing, and the demand was so great that we bring them back that we had to double their salary to get them back. <laughs> Here's a little commercial, if you'll click on that. It's kind of a little theater that was off of a TV station up here. We'd both be equally uncomfortable with our name.
celebrity <laughs> at all. <laughs> well, that was 10 years ago and probably not the case anymore. No, these two guys are more recognizable than ever. Still behind the wheel of Sonic's success. Oh, He's going to give you that certain uh, je ne sais quoi. Je ne sais what? Jenna. Come on, man. Did she mention me by name? Can we go way right back? Yeah, plus you're like 60, right? No. God, you're off by about 20 years. You're 80? Mm, the other way. You're 80? Double check. Up there. It's a check. Yeah, I know. There we go. All right. Good. Ball in. One more time. Come on. Quick check one. Here we go. Oh, check check one more. Oh, yeah. There we go. Wait a minute. Summer started? Yep. Whoa. It's so great that Sonic has half price shakes for St. Patrick's Day. Darn, I forgot to wear something green today. Why, Janine? Because she reminds me of my ex-girlfriend, Janine, who was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> There's a hot dog in here! It's like a Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> a waffle, 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 dog. Reese's peanut butter cups and chocolate. <laughs> Real strawberry. Oh, you make strawberry sound in 10. A lot of people don't know this, but strawberry is very densely packed with vitamin C. Burn what was the L for? Lunch. I'm pretty sure you can't let her in lunch. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. That was fast. Yeah, I could have gone far, but blew out a knee. Dang, and I paid for these cheeseburgers. Great, so we're finally enjoying them. Well, oh, I don't know. Perfect. This is how you sonic. These guys, they're hilarious. I met them in person, and I don't think they're actually acting on the TV commercials. I don't think they have lines at all. They're just stupid. <laughs> so it's pretty fun to work with them, and they're very effective. It's working really good for us. Um, that's a picture of that very first Sonic I told you about. When it was a top hat, he turned it into a Sonic. Uh, that's a pretty hot car hop, but we won't. That's, a, that's me when I was working. Do you like the hair? Let me hear it. Do you like the hair? That's me working out of Sonic in high school. Um, that was one of the first signs out front. This is actually a menu that I have in my garage right now. That was one of the original menus. This menu you'll probably recognize. This was the logo that they used, the Happy Eating logo that they used when they uh, started franchising. And they started franchising, it started in Oklahoma and, they, and then they went to Texas, Arkansas and Kansas. Uh, that was the next logo they came up with, the Happy Eating logo. And then that's today's logo. So that's kind of a, a history of Sonic. That's a picture of, of the first Sonic I worked at in Mississippi. This is a Sonic. What happened was a lot of Sonics closed and had a hard time. And we ended up with a, a president CEO of our company, of the franchise company, that actually had us all start changing the looks of our building so they looked the same. But also he started having us buy the same products and advertising together. And that's kind of where Sonic took a really big uh, leap forward and I was so fortunate so blessed in the 80s uh, after BYU and get my master's degree that I joined Sonic and and as they started to grow so this was in the 80s that was me before my mission at Sonic I don't know why I put that in there this is a Sonic in the 90s you see the little cones we had and then and the neon lights and then this is what you see more today the uh, the bullnose canopy ends and the the canopy barrel in the front and the yellow menu housing. So that's kind of our look today. This is a Sonic I'm building right now in Franklin, Tennessee. Uh, I'm actually doing something different. I'm putting garage doors on the patio. You'll see the garage doors. And so that's kind of the effect. You can raise the garage doors in the summer and lower them in the winter. And that's kind of a cool concept we're, we're trying right now. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about my life story because some of you have challenges. We all have challenges. Uh, I serve as a stake president right now, and I'm telling you, I know you all have challenges. You all have issues you're dealing with. We all do. And thank goodness for the gospel in our lives. But thank goodness to know that we can do hard things, you guys. We can do hard things. That's me again. I like showing my picture for some reason. <laughs> Let me tell you about my life real quick, if I could. Um, it wasn't the easiest life. I was born in Las Vegas to a cocktail waitress. Who, who's, whose boyfriend was not her husband, and so her, her husband kicked her out, and my dad uh, didn't want anything to do with a child, so she gave me up for adoption, which is cool. Uh, she gave me up for adoption. I was adopted by a couple, um, and then they divorced, and then my mom re remarried three more times, and my dad married again. So if you do the math, that's eight parents 
I had as a kid growing up. I had 35 stepbrothers and sisters. Um, so it's not like I had the perfect Mormon childhood family. Um, so I actually um, have a real bad memory of my past as a little kid because it was kind of tough. Um, I grew up in Oklahoma until I was 12 years old. We moved to Mississippi. Anybody from Mississippi? See, it, it never happened. Is there, are you Mississippi? Or are you just scratching your head? The education system in Mississippi is so bad, no one can get into BYU. It's, it's that bad. I think Mississippi academically ranks 52 in the nation for, for academics. So that's where I went to high school. I graduated high school at 16 years old because I could write my name in cursive, basically. Um, so I graduated high school, and I went to work for Sonic, traveling all over the country, opening new restaurants, and making a lot of money and doing really well. Um, in Mississippi, where I grew up, church on Sunday was in Arkansas, and steak, my steak was in Tennessee, so steak conference was Tennessee. So there were no members of the church in my hometown, so I kind of fell away from the church somewhat. Um, fortunate for me, I, I met a beautiful girl who's now my wife. Uh, we met when we were 16 on a church seminary trip. Um, she was sitting in the front of the bus, I was in the back. Should I tell the story? <laughs> I asked, who's the hottie up front on the bus? And they were like, that's the stake president's daughter. She's 16 and never been kissed. So I'm like, I have a mission. <laughs> so first guy to ever kiss her. Thanks. Stand up, honey, so they can see you. Isn't she good looking? <laughs> ow, ow. So, so when I was 16, I went on that seminary trip. I, I had a good time. Um, it was still difficult uh, have, staying active in the church. Um, I went through uh, a lot of family crises, and, and I ended up pretty much just being on my own after I was 16. Um, I went to college for a year and had a 1.4 GPA. Uh, that's not good. That's like a D minus average. Uh, and uh, so I figured college wasn't for me, so I would go and, and work at Sonic because I was going to flip burgers for a living anyway. Um, I changed my mind uh, to go on a mission. I went to a missionary farewell accidentally in Kingman, Arizona. Some guy invited me to church, and a missionary was given his farewell, and, and the Spirit touched me, and I knew that I needed to serve a mission. So after a long repentance process, I was 21 years old, finally went on my mission, served a mission in Quebec, Canada. So imagine this, no education, southern accent from Mississippi speaking French. It was bad. That's me on the left as I was coming home from my mission. Um, the guy next to me, Todd Tripp, lives in St. George now. He absolutely changed my life, this guy did. He taught me how to be positive and how to, and how to look to the positive and how to look to the Lord in faith that things would be okay. And I think he really uh, helped me to break through in my life so that I could have a better direction of where I was going. And then, of course, my sweetheart, Anita, when, when I came home off my mission, you know how you come and you report to the high council and, and then you shake everybody's hand, you give your, your testimony in French, and then you shake everyone's hand. Well, the stake president shook my hand and slid a note into my hand. Instead of saying, good job, elder, you know, the man hug thing, he said, call my daughter. <laughs> I'm like, yes, president. <laughs> so <laughs> I was obedient. So um, eight, year, eight months after I got home, we got married in the L.A. Temple. Um, and, then, and then check this out. You guys are going to love this story. You won't believe it, but you'll love it. 1.4 GPA, I got into BYU. <laughs> I swear I did. So my wife, my wife had one semester to go to graduate, and then she was going to be a TA and teach Spanish and master's program and all that. So I petitioned the admissions office to let me in on probation at night school, and I'd prove that I could do it, and they bought it. So I actually graduated from BYU in 1984, the year of the national championship, thank you. Um, and then I figured uh, I was going to flip hamburgers for a living, so I was good, right? Well, my wife and her father, who's a surgeon, and her brother, who's a doctor, and whose sister married a psych uh, attorney, they decided that wasn't good enough. So. I was convinced to go and get my master's degree, so I went to Memphis and uh, got my MBA in 1986. Now remember, that was really hard for me. A 1.4 GPA, no education from Mississippi, 
academic uh, education system, and I ended up with an MBA. Um, I had to work really hard. It wasn't easy. So after my MBA, I was like, okay, time out. I'm not flipping burgers for a living. I'm a stud executive now. So I thought I would get a suit coat and a secretary, and I'd have a real job. So I actually, oh, hey, Ethan. I see Ethan. Hey, Ethan. Any Tennessee kids here? Tennessee kids? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is awesome. So, um, so where was I, Ethan? <laughs> So I got my MBA, right? And then I got a job with Holiday Inn Corporation out of Memphis. And uh, I was a fi assistant food and beverage director at their training program. I hated it, hated it. And I think the main reason I did not like it is because I had a boss. And I didn't like the whole boss concept. And my ADHD kicks in, and I am not much one of reporting and, and talking to a boss, and so I'd rather and also, as hard as I worked, I still made the exact same $400 a week. Yes, you heard it, $400 a week out of MBA school. It was horrible. But I still made the same amount of money. So I said, I can do better on my own as an entrepreneur. So what I did was my wife and I were in Memphis. We were traveling to the temple. Get the correlation here. We can do hard things, but the Spirit will guide us. I was traveling to the temple with my wife. We're going through from Memphis to Nashville. There's a snowstorm, so the pass is closed at Mont Eagle, so you can't get to Atlanta. That was our temple. And so I couldn't get to the temple, so we stopped in Nashville overnight to see if the snow would clear. And um, sure enough, I went by a closed Sonic. It opened in 1972, closed in 76. It became a liquor store, a drive-in liquor store. Can you imagine that? That's what it looked like, this closed Sonic. And so here I am with an MBA, return missionary, beautiful wife, and I'm like, this is my future. <laughs> so I'll just put a sonic sign on it and start over. So went inside the liquor store and didn't buy anything, Bishop, thank you. Went inside the <laughs> liquor store and asked the guy if he would be willing to sell it. He said that he got caught selling liquor to a minor and was about to lose his license. So he said yes. So I offered $150,000 for the land, the building, and all the equipment that was in it. I was broke, I had no money. So that's part of my story on how we do things, how, how we can do hard things. So I made this offer and he said yes. So I needed another 60 grand to fix it up, to make it look nice. And uh, so I went to Sonic and found three Sonic franchisees who were existing and had money. And I sold myself and I said, I'll do the sweat equity. You guys put up the money and I will own 40%. You guys each own 20% and then we will, I'll do all the work, and I'll send you mailbox money. And so they, they chipped in uh, the $60,000 plus the one hundred and fifty, and I became a partner. So I actually owned 40% of the land and building and the business. Uh, it wasn't just a few short years later that I bought all three of them out and, um, and started building more. That's the, what it looks like today. Uh, it went through a flood. Talking about hard things, it was a profitable business, and we had a flood, and look how high that water is. And we try to order, a canoe pulled up to order one time. <laughs> like, what the heck? Um, but the end result was we, we were able to um, remodel it, and so it looks like that today. So it turned out really nice, and it's a very profitable business. It does, that, I paid 150000 for the land and building. It did over $2 million in sales last year. Yes, thank you, thank you. We can do hard things. Speaking of hard things, um, I love doing hard things like Ironman races. So Ironman is two and a half mile swim, 112 mile bike, and a marathon. Anybody done one in here? You have? Sweet, where'd you do it? Texas, I did Texas. Was it hot? So hot, so hot and humid. So Ironman takes things to a different level. I was never an athlete. I was five foot six when I graduated high school. I was allergic to milk. I was in the band, played the trombone. Still had girls because of that. Girls like the trombone. <laughs> Lindsay. Why don't you tell everybody how many you've done? I've done 15, I've done 15 Ironmans. Um, last October, I did the World Championship in Kona, Hawaii. And that's me looking all happy. How studly is that picture? <laughs> <laughs> I was just so happy to get off the bike. In Kona, the lava fields, 95 degrees, just brutal hot. 
But, you know, crossing the finish line tells me that I can do hard things and I can succeed at whatever I put my mind to. My daughter on that next to me has done three Ironmans with four babies. She's done three Ironmans. So um, you guys can do anything you set your mind to. And if Dave Watson could do an Ironman, all of you can. You can accomplish anything you try to. Uh, that's the same Sonic I showed you. How did I get from that one Sonic to several? Um, it was very hard. It was a very hard thing. When we opened that Sonic, it was on the wrong side of town. It was a liquor store, and the Walmart moved that was next to us. It moved to the other side of town. So for four years, I literally worked 80 to 100 hour weeks. If my wife and baby wanted to come see me, they would come to the Sonic and see me there. Um, in fact, they would walk across the graveyard to come see me because we couldn't afford the gas. It was a hard time in our lives, but we, we worked really hard. And then the second unit, what I did was I found a location, and the land was $35,000, and I found the lot, and, and I found a contractor who would build a building. So I went out trying to borrow three or $400,000 to do this, and it was the hardest thing I've ever done was trying to get a loan for that. I finally got a banker who I still use today uh, to loan me the money, and I opened my second unit. And a cool story about that opening, uh, Jason, are you still here, J-Dog? Hey, back there, y'all, is J-Dog right there, the guy that owns the hot dogs of Utah right there. Give it up for Jason. <laughs> yeah, Jason. J-Dogs are amazing. I had one just two days, three days ago. So Jason's a good friend of mine. He, um, he st I met him in this class, actually, doing a lecture series, and he actually won the entrepreneurship contest, and, and now he's got several units. It's really hard, Jason, isn't it, going from the first unit to the second. Really difficult step, because you almost have to step down to step up, because somebody's got to take care of your unit while you're opening the second unit. I'll never forget the day I opened my second unit, and... Uh, we worked hard. We got it all cleaned up, ready to go. We turned the lights on, and you would have thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread in this town. Everybody in the whole stupid town came at the same time. And so we ended up having people direct traffic, and we had cars all the way down the, the, the road. People were pouring in, and it was horrible. We did a terrible job. It was 30 minutes to get a hamburger. And I'll never forget about 1.30 that day when everybody cleared out, and the lunch rush slowed down, that I actually stood in front of that Sonic and cried. I actually got emotional. I thought, I am going bankrupt. I have ruined it. I've blown it. Um, and I'll never forget the employees coming up saying, Mr. Watson, it's okay. We'll do better. And so we figured out where our bottlenecks were. What, you know what we did? We actually took all of our employee cars and parked them in the stalls so people thought those were customers. <laughs> so we actually only had like 10 customers at a time instead of 30. Uh, so the night rush came, we handled it better, and, and it got better. That next year, I built six units. I built six of them, and I uh, was able to um, do that through other people's money as well. Um, Jason and I were talking about this this morning. This morning. Um, I would have to take 20% down on a $400,000 project. That's $80,000 that I needed to open another Sonic. And so I would go and get partners who would be silent, passive partners to give me the 80,000 and then I would send them what I call mailbox money. I would give them 10% ownership for 40 grand, for example, and then for the rest of their lives they would get a check as I made profit. And so I did that. That's how I was able to build six units in one year. So I know a lot of you are asking yourself, how do you get from one to several? Uh, other people's money worked really good for me. I just had to make really sure, and I made a couple of mistakes with partners where I didn't have really good agreements, but the key is that to have them be silent, passive, and not have their nose in my business, and they needed to trust me and let me run it. And so I was able to do six units that next year. I ended up, uh, I think I've owned over 60 of them, and uh, today I have 30 that are operating and, and doing really well. So um, one of the things that I have, have really planned my career around is this phrase that you can't swim across the lake with all the gold on your back. If you do, you'll drown. And so I really shared a lot of my profits. Um, my managers make really good money. I have supervisors that don't even get a salary. They only get part of the profits. I believe in sharing the profits with my, my management team and people that actually flip the burgers. And I think that's helped me to be successful. 
Um, uh, some of the points I wanted to make sure we discussed today is a lot of people always ask me the difference in an LLC and a corporate. Well, I did all LLCs. Every Sonic that I have is its own limited liability company. And, um, and, and I've set them all up that way because I have different partners in all 30 of them, for example. So um, I have 30 different companies and I use the limited liability company. It seems to work the best. Um, you have a, a, a little more risk um, one way or the other, but you can look at both of those directions and figure out what's best for your business. Uh, my organizational chart, um, as a franchisee, I have two other, three other partners that are also franchisees, and we have uh, a director of operations who's also a part owner in the franchise, and then he has uh, supervising partners, five or six supervising partners that each have five or six stores each, and so that's kind of how our organizational chart looks. Um, so really, if, if anything goes bad for me to hear about it, it has to go through several levels before I hear about it. Um, I deal mostly with legal issues, um, uh, real estate, uh, insurance, uh, financing, those kind of things is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, product quality issues, we always deal with food safety is huge nowadays. Uh, when I worked at Sonic, we had the five second rule. You know, if anything hits the floor, you got five seconds. Um, that's not true. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> Nowadays, you can't even use the same spatula for a chicken as you do a beef. You, everything's very, very complicated on, on food safety nowadays, but I think it's important. Uh, regulations, um, Obamacare affects me. I have, I have 1,300 employees, so Obamacare is important to me and what the future holds there and, and insurance needs. Uh, ongoing capital, um, that's always a going concern. You always have to keep putting money in your restaurants. If you don't, they'll become dilapidated and, and broken down, and uh, people will not uh, continue to go there. So we continue to, to borrow money and put money in them and, and uh, refurbish them. Um, I tell you, one thing I wanted to make sure I, I said to you all is how important it is that you, that you don't lose yourself in the business and that you, you spend time in your church callings, home teaching, and the things that are important. And it's real important that you pay tithing um, my goal is to pay $100,000 a year in tithing. I think that's a good goal. Um, and that makes you a million dollars a year. So I think that's a good, a good thing and pay generous fast offering. I, I know the Lord will bless you as you do those things. I'll never forget the day um, that we went to our first Sunday when I bought the liquor store. And the bishop was like, uh, well, you're going to be really busy. We probably don't want to give you a calling right now because you're going to have to work on Sunday, and you're going to be real busy. And I'm like, no, give it to me, Bishop. Give me a calling. So he made me the ward mission leader, which was sweet because the missionaries could actually eat at Sonic while they were coordinating with me in the missionary work. So it worked out really good. Any missionaries from Nashville? Return missionaries from Nashville? Oh, bummer. All the missionaries in Nashville eat half price whenever they want. So <laughs> pretty cool. Um, so anyways, it's a lot of work, and it's hard, the fast food business. But it's so worth it. And let me share with you a slide now. Um, it's somewhat bragging, but I, I, I think it's going to blow some of your minds when you think how much money is there in fast food? How much money is there in hot dogs? And is it really a bad thing to flip burgers for a living? Is it really a bad thing to deal with, with the government regulations, with food safety? It's not. It's all worth it. I love it. It's a lot of fun. And it does really well. This is a, uh, a profit and loss statement. So showing our, our money that comes in and the money that goes out and how much is left over. Um, we take all of our profit and loss statements, all 30 of them, and combine them into one and then divide it by 30. And this is called an average profit and loss statement. So this is all my stores averaged together. Um, it's in uh, December of 2016, which was the last quarter that just closed, you'll see that we had food sales uh, net royalty sales of 1.7 million. Um, that was the average. So my average store does 1.7 million. You'll see that I spent 26% of that on food, 3.39% on paper, uh, for a total of uh, 509,000 on food and paper. And then the next uh, category is really important. It's everything in our business, crew labor and management labor. 22.14 uh, is what we spent on labor. Uh, plus the overtime, and then our managers, look how much I pay my managers, isn't that embarrassing? The manager makes 27000 a year, 
Who wants to work at Sonic for 27,000 years? Nobody. Oh, Lindsay does. <laughs> Thanks, Lindsay. <laughs> uh, check this out. Here's the cool line, though. Right down here, remember I said I share the profit with the managers? So the manager bonus, that manager made 51 grand in bonuses. So an average Sonic manager of my group uh, makes, help me, 76,000, 77,000. And that doesn't include his insurance and, and cell phone and those kind of things. So I think it's pretty sweet. I like it. Um, but you'll see here that we, we pay money, we pay money uh, 5 to 6% just to use the Sonic name. So a nickel out of every dollar goes to use the Sonic name. Um, and then, of course, you've got interest. You've got rent. Look how much average rent we pay per store average. The cool thing about these Sonics is I own all the real estate. So they pay me 116, well me and some other, I got partners as well, but we average about $100,000 a year in, um, in rent, 116 actually, and uh, it's kind of cool to be able to take those checks to the bank and pay off your property and, and uh, it's a fun business. I really enjoy it. So I flip burgers for a living, right? It's not so bad, is it? Huh? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. We got your money. Can I have a couple more minutes? Because I want to share something with y'all real quick. I think we need to end in the next six minutes. But I flip burgers for a living, and I can do hard things, and so can you. But I want to give you one of the keys to my success that I think helped me to be successful in not only business but also in life, and that's this balance wheel. When I was a YSA, um, just off my mission. My stake president, my father-in-law, gave this exact presentation. And he told me how important it is that I keep balance in my life. And shared this will with me. And it's something that I've always cherished. And I've taught it a thousand times. It's so important. Right now, education for you guys is probably really messing up your balance will, isn't it? It's probably taking two-thirds of your life right now. Um, that's OK, because it took a lot of mine when I was in school. And when I was working 80 to 100 hours a week, it was messed up as well. But my goal in mind was to get the balance wheel straightened out and in balance. And that means I need to spend the right amount of time with my family. Um, I have a beautiful wife, two children. I have four grandbabies. And I love spending time with them. Um, I think that's so important. As we heard yesterday, families are eternal. And it's so important. Uh, but it's important that you, you take care of your family. And then church and or community, if I give this speech at a non-LDS uh, uh, university, I talk about being involved in your community as well as your church. Um, I actually have done that. I stayed actively involved in my community. And uh, I've served as stake presidency member for nine years, bishop for five, and now stake president, ward mission leader. I just serve, and I've been a home teacher. And I believe that the Lord has blessed me because I've, I've given that time and, and service to his church. And then the, there's my selfish part. The last one, self, so important. So important that you play golf, that you go out on the boat, that you ski, that you do triathlons, that you do things for you, things that are fun. Because if you don't, you're going to be miserable and the other three wheels are going to be messed up. So um, I hope that you'll kind of take that to heart and, um, and work on yourself, especially as you graduate and start your career, that you don't let your balance wheel get out of whack. And um, I just am um, so grateful that y'all let me come here and, and share this speech with you. And uh, hope you have a great day.